Often, when I speak about the many reasons why I chose to leave the faith and leave Christianity and no longer place my blind trust in the words of the Bible, I'm frequently given the real reasons by friends, family, and detractors that I actually left the faith. In other words, I'm immediately accused of having other or ulterior motives that are different than what I'm actually stating. And recently I found out that this is actually a common phenomenon with those who are leaving the faith. Another YouTube channel uh, called The Truth Hurts, which is actually led by Harrison Cother, who's actually an ex-Jehovah's Witness who is now an atheist. In his video, he explained what the real reasons were that he left Jehovah's Witnesses according to his father and friends and, and close, close friends that he had in the past. Of course, the real reasons that he's sharing aren't the actual real reasons. They're just the reasons that were given to him by everyone that's against him. I thought, this is genius. I deal with this every day. And so, Harrison, you've inspired me. I want to share five reasons that I really left the faith based on what I'm being told and kind of address those things very quickly. A really cool quote by Harrison said, you don't get to choose why you left the religion your religion does. And I can't agree more. The idea that once you leave the faith, once you leave the congregation, they're going to make up all these additional reasons, completely different from what's actually true, to justify the real reason why you left the faith, regardless of what those reasons are. We're going to discuss five of those reasons right now. So according to my detractors, ex-friends, and now distant family members, what are the real reasons that I chose to completely abandon my Christian faith and become agnostic? The first one is similar to Harrison's, and it's that because I am proud and dishonest. You see, it's commonly understood according to biblical teachings that those who will not submit to the uh, biblical ideas are prideful, and those who will submit to the Christian concepts or biblical concepts are humble. In other words, if you're a theist, you're humble, and if you're an atheist, you're automatically prideful and you refuse to listen to God. But is that true? Is it really a prideful thing to seek out and find information that disagrees with what you've been teaching and taught your whole life, and then admit you were wrong and change your mind? Is that a prideful thing to do? Or is that a humble thing to do? A perfect example that Harrison gave was he showed a stack of books that he read which defend the Christian apologetic from many different viewpoints and defend the Jehovah's Witness viewpoint. For me, I was raised on a stack of books in Christianity, uh, teaching me all the ways to defend Christianity for, from different perspectives, whether it's from scientific perspectives or philosophical ones. I was raised talking about that, learning about that, and reading about that. To this day, I could offer any Christian apologetic book supporting and defending Christianity to my father or to my uh, friends or my now distant family, and they'd be happy to read those books and consider the truth within them if they can find it. But if you showed another stack of books, that was the exact opposite. If I offered my father, for, for example, or some of my close friends the opportunity to read some of the books that I've been reading recently that are written by secular authors, which question Christianity and the biblical narrative, well, of course, most people refuse to read those books. Actually, right when I came out of Christianity about, uh, I don't know, over a year ago, one of my friends was trying to convince me to come back. And we had a really interesting conversation where he said, I want to know what you know. Can you please explain to me what caused you to get to the position you're in and leave Christianity? And I was, I was so thankful that he asked. So glad to have someone who's willing to search this out with me. And I said, look, here's some books that I've been reading. Here's some uh, different articles and websites to go check out. And he stops me and goes, wait, I need to stop you right there. Are those... Are those written by secular authors? And I was like, of course, they're written by secular authors. There's a lot of these secular authors are ex-Christians. They used to be Christian, many of them. But yeah, of course, it's not written by Christian. Christians aren't going to write books to debunk Christianity, dude. And he was like, oh, well, I'm, I, uh, I'm not going to read any material written by non-Christians. You can't trust that stuff. And I'm, I remember just being like, bro. You will always be stuck in whatever cult you're placed in if you put that rule on yourself and don't allow yourself to read other literature and think outside of your little box that you've been born into. The reality is it takes a huge amount of humility 
to face these ideas that completely contradict what you've been learning and teaching your entire life, what all your family believes. It's extremely humbling experience to go before your parents, friends, family, or publicly on YouTube like I did and tell everyone that you were wrong, that you believe you were wrong, you made a giant mistake and that you want to correct that by letting people know now that you've chosen to leave Christianity for X, Y, and Z reasons. It's a very humbling, difficult, uh, painful experience. And generally speaking, I think Christians should already know that it's pride that keeps people from changing their mind. It's pride that keeps people in confirmation bias and in cognitive dissonance. They're unwilling to admit that they're wrong. And it's pride that keeps pastors teaching the same thing over and over and over again. And it's pride that keeps everyone in the Christian faith from disagreeing constantly. No one can really agree with anyone else on anything because everyone already knows everything. <laughs> Changing your mind, admitting you were wrong, and correcting yourself is an attitude of humility. And it's an attitude of growth, not an attitude of pride. So let's just flip flop that around and send it right back your way. The second reason is that I don't want accountability. Again, some of these reasons mirror Harrison's and some are a bit different in ways, but I don't want accountability. And that's, that's huge. That's probably the most read reason I see on my comments section and emails and messages that I receive. I don't want accountability. I want to live a wicked and sinful life. And so I can't take it anymore. I have to retract back into my old sinful, my old sinful ways. First of all, I just want to say that, like Harrison mentioned, Christians seem to have a very hard time with secular morality. And I personally actually already did a video or two talking about secular morality and just the, the natural tendency of humans to be kind and socialize and work together and share and protect each other, just like many animals in the animal kingdom also do. But secular morality comes from a lot of different natural places, a lot of natural instincts. And, um, Christians just seem to think that if you don't believe in the God of the Bible, that you're just going to run out and become a serial killer or some sort of uh, sick, twisted screw up. The irony of this statement, however, is that to say that I don't want to be accountable to a God that I don't even believe is real or exists is kind of, it's sort of completely misunderstanding my entire mindset. I don't believe that Yahweh is real or that his word is true or that I will be held accountable for any of these things. I don't think anyone will be held accountable according to that Bible by some God living up in the highest heavens. I don't think that's going to happen. So my desire to not be held accountable can't be a factor since I don't think there is accountability at all in the first place. Again, Harrison gave a perfect example about his dad. Jehovah's Witnesses, I believe, don't practice Christmas. And in fact, a lot of the Christians that follow this channel, or at least used to follow me on this channel in the past, also didn't celebrate Christmas, myself included. And so it'd be a lot like telling someone who doesn't celebrate Christmas, look, the reason you don't celebrate Christmas, the real reason you don't celebrate Christmas is because you don't want to be accountable to Santa Claus's naughty and nice list. Obviously, that is just completely nuts since the reality is no one believes in Santa. If you don't believe in Santa, then you can't be held accountable on his list, nor would you even be worried about being held accountable on his list. That's a lot like the way I feel about Yahweh. Also, I've personally noticed an increased sense of personal accountability and a personal sense of responsibility for my actions that has actually become much deeper and much more literal and sincere since leaving Christianity. No longer can I look back on my sin of yesterday or last week or last month and say, oh, the devil made me do it. Oh, I fell victim to temptations of the flesh. Oh, God was testing me. Oh, everything has a purpose and I'm forgiven in Jesus Christ. You must forgive me in Jesus Christ. I must forgive me in Jesus Christ. We all need to forgive each other and ourselves in Jesus Christ, no matter what the crime. Without Jesus or God, I can't arbitrarily wipe away my mistakes and demand forgiveness from God or you or myself or anybody else. I can't blame Satan or lust of the flesh or anything for my mistakes or bad decisions. Without the God of the Bible, you have to admit that you made a bad decision and then you have to actually deal with that, pay for that, account for that, and live with your decisions. I don't think I'm going to get all my sins just magically wiped away clean and I'm going to live in a happy, 
fairy tale land all because I confess the name of Jesus Christ. I don't think that's even fair or logical. And, and now I'm left with the responsibility of making good decisions for myself and for my family simply because it's a smart decision. When I make a bad decision, I'm stuck with that decision and I have to pay for it, reconcile with it, deal with it, grow, learn. I can't just say, devil made me do it. Jesus forgives me. Let's move on. Number three, the third reason why I really left Christianity, according to my detractors, is that I am a contrarian at heart and I just simply love to disprove stuff. Look, it took me 37 years to even consider that the Bible or the God of the Bible or Jesus was fiction. And it took me 38 years to come to the conclusion that I'm agnostic. In fact, for f almost five years, I taught the Bible online and ran around doing baptism events and praying for people and conducting counselings and doing all the work of the faith. And during that time, I never generally questioned that the Bible was inspired by God. The Bible's teachings for me actually lended themselves to conspiratorial topics. They kind of promoted conspiratorial topics. I can't tell you how many uh, scriptures are taken outside of context or even in context to justify a bunch of fictional conspiracies from the past. So giving up the Bible actually removes the justification I had for a lot of the conspiratorial topics that I was into. So removing the Bible doesn't make me more conspiratorial. It actually makes me less conspiratorial. Thinking that someone's a contrarian or just likes to disprove things can go in any direction. So that's not really proof of anything. You can be an agnostic atheist and be a contrarian in that realm and study against that and become a Christian, just like you could vice versa. In fact, some people have done that kind of thing. We see it across many religions, political debates, and different types of topical arguments. There are contrarians who like to question whether or not the status quo or the generally accepted information is really accurate, good information that should be generally accepted. And I don't think there's anything wrong with people asking those type of questions. And so even if it's true that I'm prone to being conspiratorial or I'm prone to looking for the antithesis, the antithesis. <laughs> I might be looking for alternative opinions that disagree with mainstream opinion. It's something that I've done in every topic all the time, everywhere. And in fact, doesn't the Bible teach us that it's foolish to not hear every side of a story before making a decision? I think it's folly and shame to answer a matter before hearing it out, something like that, right? Number four, and this is one of the biggest ones, one of the most annoying ones actually, is that I'm bitter, and so I threw the baby out with the bathwater. And I wanna address this in many different ways. First, to just say that I'm bitter, and I just threw everything out, threw the baby out with the bathwater, and I'm not being careful about, about everything, is just supreme, classic gaslighting is what that is. You see, people who say that I'm just bitter and threw the baby out with the bathwater would want you to believe that I made my decisions about my faith emotionally and illogically and irrationally based purely on just a psychological or emotional episode. The reality is I actually made my decision very, very analytically and rationally and the exact opposite is true. Christians are the ones who typically tug on emotional heartstrings to get a reaction, whether it be during the long drawn out worship services or the altar calls, or even some of these really well edited tiers of Christian YouTubers that we see today. Heck, even the, the shame, the fear, guilt, and shame is all emotional manipulations to try and get you to act and behave and believe a certain thing within the Christian realm. Even within this accused reason where they throw on me that I'm just bitter and throwing the baby out with the bathwater, they do this again. They use emotion to try and manipulate you into believing that I have no clear, rational evidences and proofs for why I made the decision that I made. Secondly, as Harrison Cother pointed out, bitterness itself isn't exactly a bad thing. In fact, bitterness has been used to enact dramatic social change all through time. The definition of bitter is feeling or showing anger, hurt or resentment because of bad experiences or a sense of unjust treatment. When you leave Christianity and Christian thinking and start thinking more critically of church history and your own personal history with Christianity, 
it can become quite easy to feel feelings of resentment especially with those who indoctrinated you into these ideologies in the first place. This is the same with the ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Mormons, and even ex-Muslims, many whom continue on to teach and encourage others to find an escape from their mental, emotional, and psychological game of control through fear, guilt, and shame. In other words, many a, a Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, Muslim, and other groups of religious and non-religious peoples have become bitter because of the way they were indoctrinated and have become irritated because of the deceit that they found within their, within their system or religion or social group. And they've used that as a means to make change, to enact change, to wake people up. This has been done in almost every single area of a society. So bitterness in and of itself isn't a bad thing. Although it would be nice if Christians could convince you that anytime someone's bitter, they only make emotional decisions. Unfortunately, that is just clearly not true. And honestly, a lot of the bitterness that I kind of felt actually occurred after I started sharing my reasons why I no longer trust the New Testament. And I started experiencing the Christian love that I received after that. That's when the bitterness started to, if any, started to really sink in. But it really didn't even last that long, to be honest with you. I was irritated. I was mad. And I was sad. And it was all emphasized and strengthened by just the mocking reactions, the false accusations, the slander, and the fact that most of my friends and family went running in the other direction. So yes, these type of conversations and these type of decisions can cause and create some forms of bitterness in some people, but that isn't necessarily always a bad thing and nor does that automatically justify this rationality that that means that all my decisions are now emotional. Also throwing the baby out with the bathwater is just such a common regurgitated meme that implies that although I found real legitimate accurate reasons to discard some of the information from the Bible or to question the Bible's authenticity, accuracy, or morality that I've also accidentally discarded truly valuable and important information as well. To say that I threw the baby out with the bathwater admits that the Bible is not inerrant and is actually full of problems and errors. The reality is though, to say that I'm bitter and that because of I'm bitter, I threw the baby out with the bathwater irrationally is ignorant for one because it shows that you have literally no idea how i came to the conclusions that i came to two it shows that you're narcissistic and you have no capability whatsoever to empathize with other human beings who have viewpoints that are different from your own you can't fathom that another intelligent human being might think differently than you do you can't be wrong right it's impossible i know it's hard to imagine that other intelligent human beings also have valid viewpoints and feelings last it's ironically insulting. It assumes that I'm only capable of compiling and gathering and researching and teaching information that supports the biblical narrative, but that I'm completely incapable of doing the same thing to the contrary. Truthfully, if you can't honestly explain the opinions that are contrary to yours, then you haven't really made an educated decision in the first place. And the last point on this baby out with the bathwater thing is I have to just ask, what baby? Are we talking about Jesus or God or the New Testament or the Old Testament? Which baby was thrown out with what bathwater? I have legitimate, logical, and rational reasons to believe that the characters in the Bible were in fact fictional and don't really contain the full historicity that people would like for you to, to think they do. I've studied rational, logical arguments for discarding both the New Testament and for discarding the Old Testament. I just want to know what baby was thrown out with what bathwater. You have to first establish that there actually is a baby or some provable truth that I've discarded accidentally with some bathwater. And the burden of proof is actually on others to prove the historicity and accuracy of the Bible, not on me. Do you only believe that there really is a baby hidden somewhere in the bathwater because you were taught that there is uh, inerrant truth hidden somewhere in the scriptures of the Bible by your friends and family? Are you prematurely assuming that there actually is a baby in the bathwater that can be discarded in the first place without actually taking the time to patiently, logically, and rationally 
make sure the baby really is there. And now the fifth reason for why I really left the Christianity is that I never really experienced God. I never really experienced the Christian God the way many others have. And so I'm not really read in to the secret spiritual mysteries and emotional connections that you're supposed to have with Jesus Christ and his Bible. First, I just want to say emotional and psychological experiences are a very real and a very powerful thing that can be the catalyst for giant change. It can be the catalyst even for placebo healing. It can be a catalyst for a lot of powerful movements. But how many other religions have also claimed that they also have deep, meaningful, personal, spiritual relationships and revelations from God, all of which were designed to solidify their faith in their current religious system? Likely a Muslim who has a powerful experience with God, and if that experience confirms for that Muslim that the ways of Islam are true and that his path of righteousness is correct, then a Christian would likely say that that Muslim's experience with God was false or a deception. But you have to remember that that goes both ways. So having an experience with God can't be a logical, rational, and even way of making that argument. Since a Muslim can say the same thing about a Christian who has experiences with God, that they are also being deceived or tricked by the devil. Since anyone can make this claim about anyone else without any substantiated proof, it's just simply not a logical or a valid argument. Listen, through my 38 years, I went to church, Christian school, all the youth groups, counselings, I conducted counselings, I led prayer groups, I was in prayer groups, I did group Bible studies my entire life, all my teenage years, in through my 20s, all the way up through my 30s. I did personal Bible studies. I did baptism events. I was baptized. I baptized other people. I was preaching and teaching and fasting and praying and having deep, meaningful experiences all throughout the entire time. But feeling God isn't even something that's a salvific requirement according to the Old Testament or the New at all. But instead, it has become another distracting emotional manipulation. If you fall victim to the tears, the music, and the pretty word pictures used to create an emotional sensation of quote unquote experiencing God, you need to know that this experience is felt in many, many emotional and psychological contexts, not just in the pews. An emotional response is not an experience with God. But I fear for many Christians that it is, and that's why so much time and money is put into the music, the sound, the spoken word, and all the imagery used during worship mantras and during altar calls. Again, Christian and Torah teaching YouTubers know this, and some have spent months and years perfecting the art of creating this emotionally powerful environment for their viewers and some have even sought me out to learn how to create that emotional manipulation. <clears throat> P.S. When a YouTuber isn't live and they cry while they're teaching a, se a session or lesson, they could very easily just record it again without crying and post a version of it that doesn't have tears and music and all this sadness. Just remember, when you see anyone, a pastor, a YouTuber, anyone, cue the music and cue the tears, you have to wonder if you're being emotionally manipulated. And those, my friends, are the five real reasons why I left the faith, according to my detractors. Of course, if you want to understand the real reasons why I left the faith, then do me a favor and make sure you subscribe and then go and check out some of my other videos, which explain in much more detail some of the serious concerns that I have with biblical literature. I'm going to link Harrison Cother's The Truth Hurts video below so you can go check that out if you're interested or if you're a recovering Jehovah's Witness, you can connect with Harrison over there. And other than that, until next time, I'm Justin Best with Busting Jest. Later. I know you told your friend you're not okay And tell me what's wrong and why you